I hope I didn't come back too early <laughs> to interrupt your lunch. Before I take up the questions and answers, is everybody can hear me? Before we broke up for lunch, and I'm very, very happy to welcome you now, uh, the after lunch session of this one day satsang program that we have every month. I was speaking to you briefly about the role of a perfect living master. I was telling you they don't come to teach us something. Enough books exist to learn the same thing they teach. Enough teachers are there teaching the same things they teach. It's not in the teaching that we get something from them. It's in their unconditional love with which they pull us. They love without judgment. They love us. If they say, we accept you, that friendship, that word, I accept you, is still eternity. Not for this lifetime, but forever. It's a pull that lasts forever. Their love has no judgment. They will love you if you love them. They will love you if you hate them. They will love you if you kill them. That is the nature of their love. Is totally different from what we think is the love that we have for people. So this unconditional love, that pull that comes up, is the way they are taking us back home. Teaching is just because our mind wants it. So they give us meditation, they teach us techniques, they talk about techniques, methods, all the things that mind loves. They just talk about them to take us over a little stage. Then we think everything belongs to our thinking. We'll get everything by intellectual processes and we can find everything through that. I remember a group of professors and barristers from England had come to see the great master. And they said to him, Master, you are talking about things that are beyond the mind. You say there are some things the mind cannot comprehend. We are all educated people. We have educated ourselves through our minds. We have been able to use our minds to analyze everything. Our minds have been able to create the biggest inventions, the greatest discoveries. Our mind has been able to understand the functioning of the mind. Our mind has been able to understand the functioning of the soul body. How can you say that the mind cannot understand spirituality? What part of spirituality is it that the mind cannot understand? And Great Master said, Do you believe in God? They all said, Yes. We do believe in God. Do you believe in one God? Yes, we believe there's only one God. Do you believe that God has never been split into pieces? Oh no, God cannot be split. He's only one God. Do you also believe that God is within you? All religions have said that. That the living God is within you. The kingdom of God is within you. They all say God is within you. Do you believe that? Yes, we believe. Explain to me mentally, intellectually, how one God, without dividing himself, is in all of you sitting here. For a while there was a silence. They said, we never thought like that. He said, that's the truth. There is one God, never split. He's always been whole, always total. And the whole total God is in each one of you without breakup. And you are so many. How can that happen? Does it make any mental sense at all? Can intellect explain this phenomenon? that we are all witnessing right now. They said, Master, we didn't think like that. But what you are saying is true. That we are all believing that there is only one God and he's total whole God and each one of us is trying to find that God within ourselves. How can that be? He said, you can't have an answer so long as you are confined to the mind. Just go above the mind. Discover what your soul is. Discover what your consciousness is and you'll find that there was only one and it's the experience of the one that creates the many. And the many are invested with the same consciousness of the one and look like many, experience like many, yet they remain one. Do not think that the soul is a drop of the ocean. Many people think like that. Many people think that there's a vast ocean which is our true home. We are poor souls, little drops that came out long ago from that ocean. And we have been separated from the ocean for millions of yugas and so many years we have been away. 
now time has come for us to go back on a spiritual journey slowly and with difficulty with struggles we'll go slowly step by step and ultimately reach that ocean to which we belong and merge in it this story i heard when i was a child when i found this is the spiritual path i said i'll never follow the spiritual path if i am a drop from the ocean separated from the ocean i am enjoying my identity as a drop the sun shines upon me and i show all the radiance of the of this rainbow in me i have a great time as a drop and they are telling me follow a spiritual path i travel with struggle all the way back go and merge in that ocean i lose everything i have right now ocean will gain nothing by one more drop this is the worst lose lose game one can play and it's called the spiritual path this is very upsetting for me master explained to those people that the truth cannot be perceived by the mind that the drop contains the whole ocean and it's not a drop separated from the ocean it's a drop within the ocean it's a drop it's the ocean becoming a drop for its own experience remaining the ocean within the drop therefore our soul is not a drop from the ocean it is the ocean experiencing a drop how can the mind understand it yet when you rise above the mind it becomes clear as an experience to you it is the truth when you find that the drops are all within the ocean and the ocean is in each drop the same essence is the same drop you realize how god is in each one of us and not separated at all not broken at all he explained there are so many things like this that we cannot comprehend with the mind but we can find out by our awareness beyond the mind a perfect living master takes us to that experience which is beyond the mind and that is why we discover who we are so long as we are attached to the mind and work with the mind we identify ourselves with the mind through the mind we identify ourselves with the sense perceptions through the mind and sense perception we identify ourselves with this physical body and we think this is it we are the body having senses having mind and life force that the real thing is the body it just contains all these things little realizing is the is the other way around all together there is consciousness that generates through its consciousness the experience of its soul a consciousness that contracts itself and becomes a soul and all souls in one soul and that becomes a soul creating a mind to experience differently around it he creates sense perceptions around it to have different experiences and a body physical body around it and each one of these units each one of these units contains the truth within itself not outside it is not from outside coming inside it's from inside going and projecting outside at all time at all levels therefore the truth always is within no matter where you are even if you are in heaven hell in this higher regions in brahm par brahm anywhere the truth is always inside what is being created as an experience is outside around you projected outside so once we know this simple trick simple trick go with it at all times within where where your consciousness is where your attention is from where the attention is flowing just find out where am i thinking out from where am i talking from where am i looking out from where is all coming from where is this physical body or any other body go within that where ever consciousness is coming out from and this is called the reversal of putting attention on something the withdrawal of attention so long as you learn how to withdraw attention to your own self you will discover your the further you want to go the more you will discover a perfect living master does not say i went to such khand this morning so i remember i am going to tell you about it a perfect living master is in such khand aware of such khand when he talks to us about such khand he doesn't talk about anything that he has either recalled or learned recalling and learning is a mental experience he talks directly from experience that's happening at that time when he's talking therefore there is great authority in the statement these people make when i was reading the bible the sermon on the mount i found it's a powerful sermon making very great suggestions at the end in the bible it wrote about jesus he speak like one with authority and not like the scribes that's the difference the scribes the learned people 
who have read books, they recall the words of the books and repeat them for us. They try to explain things as their mind has understood it. And they don't tell the truth because they don't know the truth. They know the words about truth. They have read the words about truth, but they don't know the truth. Whereas these perfect living masters speak directly from their experience, not happened earlier, but at that very moment when they're speaking. This awareness that you can be aware of the whole show at one, at one time, you can be aware of all levels of consciousness at one time, belongs to these people, but not exclusively. Don't think it's a privilege that these people have been given. Any one of us can have that experience of totality of consciousness and experience of being at all levels at once. Any one of us. These perfect living masters don't come to say, we are unique people, we have something special. They tell us, whatever they have, you all have. The potential is the same, identical potential in each one of us. There's no difference except awareness. They arouse our awareness and make us aware of who we are, how this is all created, what's going on. And we can become exactly equal to them. Their job is to make us equal to them. When they say, we accept you as a friend, what task have they taken upon themselves? It's not a task to make you better. It's not a task to take you to that stage. It's not to task you to tell you how to fly in the astral sky. The task is to make you identical to themselves. They talk of a philosopher's stone that when it touches iron, it makes it into gold. They are not that kind of philosopher's stone. They are the philosopher's stone when it touches iron, it makes it into a philosopher's stone, into themselves. This is their task, this is their mandate, this is why they're here. So, it's so rare to find such people and yet anyone can find them by seeking them, by just seeking them within your heart, not shouting outside. You seek inside, they appear. You say, I want more than this, I want more than what the mind can give and they appear in you. Of course, before that, you may seek some other things. Then those people will appear who can give you those other things. Some people think that these masters have so much power, they can give us all the worldly things also. And they do give. We look at other people who are following masters. And they tell us, oh, my master is wonderful. Everything I wanted to give me, my job improved, I got money and my relationship changed, everything changed for the better in my life since he accepted me. I believe he's God in, in the human form. I've got so much conviction, my life has changed. The friend says, wow, that's a good thing to find such a guy, such a magical guy, and I'm having some problems. If I can get a win a lottery or something, I should go and get from this guy. So go to the guy and says, I love you very much. I am full of love and devotion like that other guy. <laughs> can I please win a lottery? Can I get a little more wealth? Can I solve my business problems? Can I solve my marital problems? Can I solve these problems that are occurring to me? The master says, yes, if you have love and devotion and meditation, you go within and find these things, you will get it. And he struggles hard and nothing happens. He says, he is no master at all. Either that guy, my friend, is telling a lie or this master is very discriminating. He picks and chooses how he wants to give some things. I tried so hard with him, whatever he said, I tried hard. He's not a master. I give it up. I'm telling you true stories. Such people, they're expecting things will happen here. They go back to the master. Master, why are you discriminating? I am following you and I am so much in love and devotion with you. You never made me win a lottery. You never gave me. One man actually said, I'll test if you are a perfect living master, if you can give me a beautiful virgin girl as my companion. <laughs> we want things that we like here. If you can't give that, how are you a master? Sorry, you are destined to have an ugly woman in your companion. <laughs> Sorry, don't blame me, your karma. You picked that up with your last life. You did something. But master, what kind of master are you then? If you can't even change that. Even ordinary people who are practicing Riddhi Siddhi, who are just psychics, they claim they can change things and you, a perfect living master, can't do it. Master says, no, 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 you should go to the Riddhi Siddhi people. Your desires are limited to that. So don't forget, when we have certain desires and aims, the master is appropriate to that. 
come up in our life. And when we just happen to come across a perfect living master who is a master for a marked sheep, who happens to be our friend, we get the benefit. But we are still looking for things for which the master thinks they are trivial, trivial things. And still we run after these little things. A person who has no money runs after pennies. But when he finds he's a millionaire, he drops the pennies, he can't think of them. When masters give those spiritual wealth to us, everything here becomes like pennies. When you discover the spiritual wealth of creation, nothing matters here. I had a friend, an American doctor, Dr. Julian Johnson, much older than me at that time. Yet he was a good friend of mine because I was studying in a school where they taught me English language and I could speak and converse with him at that age. Not many kids could do that. So he became my friend and he had come from the United States and he was a disciple of the same master. And Julian Johnson and I would go for walks together, talk together. We would go to the river, River Bias, and where he was eventually building a cave in which to meditate. And because of friendship, he allowed me also to meditate in his cave. So we were good friends. He told me something very interesting. After a few years, three or four years after he had been with the great master, he said, I want to tell you something very interesting. When I came to the master, I found how powerful he was. And I found he is like God in human body. He can do anything. So from time to time, I would get letters from my friends and family in the United States. Please seek blessings from Master so my son can graduate. Please get blessing from Master so this cousin of mine who is sick in the hospital can get well. Please seek blessings from Master so we are short of money, we can get some more money, my husband's or my wife's business will succeed. He says, every time they said that, I would go to Master, please help. And Master would say, all right, I will convey your prayers to my Master Baba Jamal Singh and I hope he will help. Every time he said the same thing. And now I have realized, after three years, that this combination of good and bad that we are having, this karma, that's creating our destiny, our pralab, with which we are born, is a platter of gifts for us. Both high and low are a combination. That's a great gift to have that combination. That made us human. And that's why we should go through them, because that's through which we can find a master and go up. That's how I found the master. He said, ever since this discovery, I have never asked the master for any worldly thing from, on behalf of anybody, not even myself. This is what he told me on the way to the river. I can't forget it. Because even I was thinking that when master can do anything, we should ask him for everything. Of course you can. But master knows what is best for us. He knows that what is in... in, in uh, in one of the scriptures, it says, Anbolat meri mithya jali. That without my speaking, he knows what I need. Then why speak? He is giving me the best in this combination of things. So that I can be a seeker and go above all these things. So that, that's why people should know that the spiritual teachings are for going beyond these worldly things, not get more attachment to these things. The masters withdraw our attachment from these things by putting an attachment upon the true love they are giving from within and outside. So they don't want to encourage our more attachments and more involvement in outside things. But we love to have these things too. Sometimes we want only these things. We don't even have that faith. What was the difference between a man who loved his master and the master gave him everything outside and inside and the man who just wanted to make use of the master. Say, because my friend got it, I am also going to pretend I love and have devotion. One man had full faith in the master. The other had no faith unless he could get things that he wanted. What is this business of faith then? What is faith? Faith is an ability to feel something you haven't seen. Faith is an ability to have something known to you somewhere in the back of your head which you cannot see with your eyes. If you can't have that faith, if you don't believe in it, no, it won't happen. Then it doesn't happen. Supposing you say, Master has told me this is going to happen, and believe it, it will happen. Period. 
Supposing you say, Master said it happen, maybe. There's a chance he said it. Maybe not. It won't happen. Not that it won't maybe happen or maybe not happen. It won't happen. Because Master will make it clear to you what is behind all these things. So how does faith come about? How do you develop this kind of faith that you always know Master is going to do and this is going to happen? It comes only through that experience, one step after another, one after another. When things keep on happening, keep on happening, even the mind begins to say, well, if so many things have consistently happened, why won't the rest happen? Even the mind that creates doubt about it, cancels our faith, also begins to follow us. This is a great quality in our human mind that it loves to be pleased in some way or the other. It loves good taste, it loves pleasure and runs after it. It also loves a variety of pleasures. It is fed up of one pleasure alone. So that's the nature of the mind. It seeks it. And that's why we have all these interactions with the universe, interactions with the world, because of the mind's built-in desires to have pleasure and seek something that pleases it. But when it finds that inside also it's getting pleasure, when it finds that the consistently things that we have been thinking of master giving, master giving are happening, it begins to have the faith in that too. Then this very mind, which is like an enemy to start with, becomes our best friend and goes along with us, making meditation and a spiritual journey so easy for us. Till then, it's an obstacle in our way. So this conversion of the mind from an enemy to a friend takes place when you have series of events taking place inside and outside, which the mind begins to see, well, there is something happening, it will happen, and joins you in believing, and that's faith. So faith is something that makes you know from experience what else could happen and will happen. Little short story. Two boys, young boys in India went to a beach. They went because on the beach there were a lot of uh, ice cream sellers and things like these were sold and they liked to have some ice cream. One of the boys had five rupees in his pocket. The other friend didn't have anything. But the boy with the five rupees invited his friend, come, I'll buy you ice cream today, we'll go to the beach. They both went to the beach to buy ice cream. There they saw a holy man sitting on the sand and making sand homes, sand castles, sand buildings. With the sand he was making those. And these two boys stopped there to see such beautiful things he is making out of sand. Then one piece of architecture that the sandman had produced was so beautiful. The boy with the five rupees said, can I buy this? And the holy man said, do you have the price to pay for it? He, he said, what is the price? He said, five rupees. He said, here's five rupees. He said, this is yours. So he brought it plywood and he picked up the sand, the castle in his hand, beautiful house. And he carried home. The other boy went on complaining and cursing him. We came for ice cream. We are returning with sand. You wasted your five bucks on simple sand. So while he was very angry and at the boy who bought the sand castle, they went home. At night, this boy who was so disappointed, not having had ice cream, had a dream. In the dream, he was flying up in the sky. And he saw that the houses there in the dream were all up in the sky and they were all lit up with light coming from them. And he saw a remarkable resemblance between those houses and the sand castles that man was making at the beach. He said, oh my God, he must be an enlightened man. He was making those designs of those houses from heaven. And I happened to be now see those. As he was flying up in the sky, he saw a house all lit up, beautiful, which is the replica of which in sand his friend had bought for five rupees. And when he passed in front of that house, his friend's name was written on it. Oh my God, my friend has bought a house in heaven for five rupees. And he woke up. He couldn't stay anymore, but he ran to his friend's house. He said, you bought a house in heaven, I saw it last night. Can I buy it 
for double the price, I'll give you 10, dollars, 10, pound, 10 rupees for that. He said, no, I'm not going to give you that sand house, I'm keeping it. You want one, you go and buy your own. So this boy ran to the beach and saw the holy man still making more houses. So he looked at one of the houses, can I buy that? And the man said, have you brought the price for it? Yes, I've got five rupees. You know, the price is 5,000 rupees. He said, what kind of inflation is this? <laughs> Yesterday it was five rupees. Today you make these houses 5,000 rupees. He said, no, my son, it is not inflation. Your friend bought the house without seeing the original. You come after seeing it. He bought on faith. You're coming after seeing it. There's a big advantage in getting things on faith. So that was the story about faith. That when we haven't seen it, but we believe it. And believe it because of an experience that is happening here, which leads us to believe it. And as these experiences multiply, we can believe all the rest. The mind begins to believe also. That generates a kind of faith. When faith is there, you get everything inside and outside. Both. It's not that then the master won't say, okay, don't talk to me about any desires of yours of the world. If you need anything, take care of them yourself. I am only responsible for the inner journey. He won't say that. Just tell me whatever you need. You will get it. And he gives it. But if you are thinking that you can exploit the master, okay, I know he can give anything. I am going to pretend something. <laughs> or I am going to test him out. I have seen people trying to test masters. Great master too. One man told me he is going to test the great master. I said, how will you test the master? He says, I will tell him I have had great spiritual experiences inside master. I have no experience at all. But I will tell him that. And see, he will be very happy. He said, yes, very good. I am very happy. So we both went to great master. And my friend said, master, so much blessing of yours. I traveled high up in the sky. And I was up into such khand. Great, thank you very much. Mahasaya said, congratulations, I'm very happy you went to Sajkhand. See, he's a fake. My friend told me, he's a fake. I never went to Sajkhand. And the master is congratulating me for something that he doesn't know anything. And after the friend goes, master is telling other people, you know, it's useless to try to test masters. So, the masters play the game with us. And if you think that you can test masters or you can exploit them or get things done in a, in a way as if they know nothing. They know everything about us. They know more about us than we know ourselves. And yet they will play the game. They will play exactly like they are like us. And that's what kind of mask they are wearing. They are Barupias. I, I don't mind telling you the story again about Barupia. Who is a Barupia? We say Barupia, the one who takes a different room, that means different form, than he really is. It means people in disguise, wearing masks. Now, there are entertainers in India who are called Barupias. And they come and entertain us by pretending to be somebody else. In the days when I used to go to college, these Barupias used to come to our house. One day, police inspector would come. You know, you committed a crime. I'm going to bring a charge against you. Sorry, sorry, what charge is it? 50 bucks. Why 50 bucks? I'm not a policeman. You thought I was. So we had to give 50 bucks. If I was not a policeman, but we believed he was, that means disguise was very good. But if we say, you are not a policeman, we know you are the guy who puts on these masks, then only 5 bucks for his costume. So this was a common thing that they would go from house to house pretending to be swamis, yogis, doctors, policemen, or whatever they could make, the kind of different disguises they had. And they could, if we guessed who they were, that they are not the real character, we still paid them five bucks for their effort and for their costume. But if we couldn't, the fee was 50, 50 rupees we had to pay. One day, I was going with my dad. We had to go and see a Yunani doctor, a Hakim. And the Hakim lived in that town, Husharpur. He lived just beyond the area where there was a red light district where the prostitutes did their work. Actually, we had to pass through that area to go to that Hakim. So my dad and I were passing through that, walking through that area. A woman comes up 
from the side, grabs my arm. Nice to see you again. I said, Dad, I don't know this woman. What do you mean, no, no? You met me yesterday. I said, Dad, she's telling a lie. She said, liar, I've never seen her. And my dad is saying, no, no, you know, young age, these things can happen. Don't try to be too. He's believing that woman. And I'm trying very hard to tell him no. I felt so embarrassed, ashamed. I didn't know what to do. I'd never seen that woman. I'd never even gone in that area. And she made so much fun of me. And I couldn't face my dad. Came back home. I said, how could this happen? Next day, a sadhu turned up at our house. He said, 50 bucks. He said, no, you are not a sadhu. He said, that's why I'm claiming 50 bucks. I am the woman. <laughs> we had to give him 50 bucks and get a relief, so I have to leave. These are the Barupiyas. That means they can disguise anything. But the scriptures say the perfect living masters are the best Barupiyas. That they can put on the appearance of totally ordinary people and deal with us in an ordinary way. And unless we know really who they inside are, they look like ordinary people. That's the perfect disguise that they can wear. So I am just mentioning to you that it is not necessary to try to test masters. They will deliberately fail. If you try to exploit them, they will, you will not succeed. And if you have love and devotion, you will succeed in everything. If you do your meditation, follow the instructions they give, with love and devotion, you will get everything inside and outside. And I'm talking from experience and not from books. I can tell you that much. So these are some of the things that you can experience with these people, these rare people. They are very few at any time in this world. A little more in this age of distraction. Sometimes they're very rare. But they come whenever we are true seekers, seeking something beyond the mind in our true hope. So I hope that all of you seekers sitting here will take full advantage when such an event happens in your life. Now, I want to know if there are any questions uh, yes. sent out. There are any questions? There I'll take up a few. Yes. Uh, have you written up the questions? <coughs> Please write them on a piece of paper and give it to me. Is there anyone who's written a question that has not given it to me yet? I'll take up the questions first, which have already been written up, and Jonathan is going to bring them up. How best to raise children when spiritual values between parents differ? The question is how to best raise children when spiritual values between the parents differ and if they differ even with the children and, they come, and the schools they go to, the education they get, the peers they have, if all these are different, how do you raise the children? Under the law of karma, children are the responsibility of the parents, they are born, Parents have to bring them up. Children are helpless. They grow up as the parents best decide to parent them. They have no option. If the parents have a different opinion how to raise children, then the stronger person carries weight, which as you know is generally the mother. Why did I say mother? Because we all married people know something. If you are if you are wrong and you keep your mouth shut, you are wise. And if you are right, you keep your mouth shut, you are married. <laughs> we know how we bring peace in the house. And peace in the house is brought up by a very practical way. And in most families, the children spend a far more time in the early stages with the mother and that view prevails. What happens if the father disagrees and says this is not the way to do it? The children are in conflict when they are raised and they suffer because of that. They suffer because of the different values that the parents are having. So sometimes for the sake of the children, it is better to talk between each other and the parents that we are not helping the children by trying to put two different trends in the child. Let's, for the sake of the children, adopt one. And if we can uh -huh. find a common ground between our values, inculcate that. This is temporary thing. 
a child only needs that parenting up to a certain age. Then suddenly the child becomes different. Totally unexpected. The parents don't even expect the child to be like that. His own destiny, his own karma comes into play. And they wonder what happened after whom is he going? But the values that you can give as part of the karmic obligation and dharma. The, the law of karma says that you are going to face events according to your past lives. You have a duty how to deal with them. That's dharma. So karma and dharma go together. Your dharma, your duty is to fulfill your duty to the best of your ability as you understand it. So in conflicting things, my advice always has been, sit together. If you can't find common ground, go to another person, third person, in whom both of you have trust, and you'll find common ground. We had a big advantage that we could go to great master. And I know several situations in India where the mother thought differently, the father thought differently. One wanted to be very lenient, one wanted to be a big disciplinarian. One wanted to not punish children, one wanted to punish children to be disciplined. And they went to great master and he found a way, media told them when to do this, when to do that. So if you can't find this, because if you keep on following your own two different values and impose them, child will be in conflict and when he grows up, becomes really clever, he'll exploit the difference between you two. And that happens to parents also. He'll put one against the other because he knows your values are different. So it's neither good for the parents nor good for the children to impose dual values on them. So my suggestion is that they should sit together, come to common value for the sake of the child. If they can't do it, go to a third party who can give them counsel on this matter. Dear Ishwarji, how does one develop, maintain, and sustain love and devotion? <clears throat> how does one develop, maintain, and sustain love and devotion? <clears throat> love is a pull from the master. We can't decide to love somebody. It's not a mental game at all. You can't mentally say, now I'm going to love this person. You try, it's never love. Love is automatically a pull from the beloved. If there is nothing in the beloved to pull you, you never fall in love. Falling in love is falling. It's not creating love. So love is never created. Love is there, it's a pull. Your response to love is devotion. When you feel the love and you want to please the one from whom we get love, it's devotion. If you want to follow what the beloved is saying, it's devotion. When you want to think about the beloved, it's devotion. When you miss the beloved, it's devotion. When master extends love and we feel it and we say we do anything to please the master, it's devotion. We want to remember the master, it's devotion. We meditate for, not for the sake of meditation, but as an offering to the master because of his love is devotion. So devotion can grow in so many ways. One mystic Sri Swami Ji from Agra says, Juti Sachi Kar Bhakti. If you cannot do bhakti, cannot have devotion, in truth, pretend you have it. Even pretension will be good. If you pretend you have devotion, it will become real devotion at some point. So therefore, we just have to respond to the love experience and that creates devotion. And if we meditate regularly and have conversations with the master on a daily basis, the, that devotion is maintained and sustained forever. How important is marriage on the spiritual path? What is its role to develop love and devotion? How important is marriage on the spiritual path? What is its role to develop love and devotion? Marriage is a consequence of past karma. It's nothing, to do with, it's nothing to do with spirituality at all. Marriage, our other relationships, our friendships are all a result of past karma. Our past associations, our finished karma leading to a reaction, our unfinished karma being finished, those sets of karmic events of the past create these relationships including marriage including children, including families. It's not a spiritual event. There have been masters, perfectly living masters, who were married, had children. My own master, Baba Savan Singh, he had four sons, he had daughters, he had people 
around him his family, extended large family. He took care of them. He earned and took care of the family like any householder. And he encouraged people, be householders like me and you won't, you don't need to run into forests and be single in order to do spirituality. Marriage is okay. His own master, Baba Jamal Singh, was a bachelor, never married. And he felt very happy that single, he is devoted and married to God. Both sides were good. So marriage or non-marriage has nothing to do with your spiritual progress. But if you are married, then you have to learn how to live together, how not to let the marriage disturb your spiritual progress, to try to both learn spiritual values that make you friends on the spiritual path. Sometimes it's possible, sometimes not. Again, because of your past karma. So the karma affects these relationships. Karma creates a kind of relationship. It's like a debt being paid. You're paying and settling old accounts. Whether we have a marriage or other relationships, they all arise from there. So don't put unnecessary emphasis on marriage being necessary for spiritual development. It's not. But if you are married, do your best and leave the rest. Are love and the shabd the same thing? Are love and shabd the same thing? That brings me to the question, what is shabd? What is shabd? Sound? If I make a noise, is it love? Not really. Then what is shabd? It has, the, our truth has been described as the shabd. Our soul has been described as the shabd. Our pathway has been described as the shabd. Shabd has been used in such a deep sense. What shabd means is something that we can hear or write. Now, how can we write the soul? We can't write the soul, but we can write the word shabd. Just like we can write the word word, W-O-R-D, word. Word with a capital W we write is the same as shabd. Both can be written, both can be heard. But does the word mean the word we are speaking now? Or does it mean more than that? If you go back to John's Gospel in the Bible, he says, in the beginning was the word, with that capital W. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. He's elevated it to the same status as God. The word means God. All things were made by him, which means the word. And nothing was made that was not made by him. He gives the entire credit for the creation to the word. In the Rig Veda, most ancient Indian scripture, the beginning of the Rig Veda it says, the entire creation took place because of the Nard, the sound. The Nard created everything. The Nard was the creator. And all things were created by that Nard. Not Nod, Nod. I talked to Nod later on. <laughs> Nod created the sound or the word created everything. Looks like the first verses of John's Gospel are first verses of the Rig Veda of India. The same thing you can find in many other literary works on spirituality. But they all describe this Shabd, Bani, word, any of these Kalma. You can go to any religion, any religious doctrine and see what kind of word are they talking about which they give the creative power of having created everything and is like the creator. The truth is that the creative power, we can give it any name whatsoever. We call it God, Creator, Ultimate, Allah, Ishwar, Parmeshwar, whatever name you want to give in your own mind to the single creative power. That single creative power keeps on maintaining its power no matter what it creates, no matter how many delegations away it goes away, no matter how many levels of consciousness it creates, the creative power continues to flow through it and flows right to where we are all sitting here and flows right inside us. You call the word or Shabd as God, correct. You call the word the Shabd as a connection between us and God, correct. You call your own true self the word, correct. You call your own soul the word, correct. You call for, want to say the way to finding your soul is the word, correct. 
all correct because that very creative power which created everything continues to flow as the power of creation inside everything and when it comes to a human being it comes and sits as experience of the self it makes us feel we are a self we have a body we can communicate who is saying this who is thinking this where is the self the self is the word now the beauty is that when it comes to the human level that very self the creative power of god now manifesting itself an experience of i am there i exist that experience of the self is audible can be heard and therefore can be written we can hear it as music our own self when we can hear our own sound that means at this stage at least it is like a word like a shabd like a song like music we can listen to our own self when we meditate and draw our attention inside the best way to go fast is to listen to your own self put your attention on the self which is audible can be heard that is why out of all the yogas which i examined i found this particular yoga called surt shabd yoga surt shabd yoga as the best for quick withdrawal of attention to your own reality surt means attention shabd means the sound yoga means union with your true self surt shabd yoga is the listening to your own self and that's the word that's the shabd now the truth is when you find that the shabd takes us to our true form of the shabd all mental thinking everything is goes away and love becomes the most essential ingredient of it then we can say shabd and love are the same that is then we can say god is love then we can say the creator's essence is love we experience it out right here god never leaves us experience what we call experience changes every time it changes every day it changes not only changes at the same level it changes from level to level we go to dream state and wake up we wake up further higher up and changes new world comes up we go higher up another world comes up but the experiencer of these different levels remains the same never changes have you ever noticed that when you are in a sleep and dreaming that dream body is not this body it's a different body but who is moving in that body the same self that was awake the same self that will be higher up the same self that will be god ultimately the self never changes shabd never changes love never changes so it depends when you want to compare is shabd love yes i say shabd is everything because everything is created from there and it also is love so once you understand the whole nature of shabd that is a connection between us and our totality that is shabd that is taking us all the way up then we realize this so called words shabd naad kalma bhange asmani music of the spheres we call them by so many things the same thing is the power of our own self pulling us towards our true self and not scattering us to experiences outside so this is a good question that when you discover yourself you will find your essence is love intuition beauty and bliss they all can arise from love one more question there be two more two more why is it that all questions and doubts fade away when i'm in your presence and why do some of these questions and doubts return when i'm physically away from you why is it that all questions doubts fade away when i am in your presence and why do some of these return when i am physically away from you very simple i keep on talking don't let you think <laughs> you forget them when i'm not there you start thinking again <laughs> the the well i'm telling you that uh, i had the same experience with great master his great master's mm, power i think that's giving you that kind of feeling because as a human being as an individual i am no different from you there's no difference i am doing nothing i am doing nothing giving you nothing 
But when you tell me you got something, I know where it's come from. It's come from great master. Because when you follow a perfect living master, he not only manifests himself in you, he embeds himself in you, that he can make him you himself. It's a great experience that you can know he is the doer of all things. In your own consciousness, you can see that happening. He leaves no difference between you and himself. Such is the power of a master. When people come and say, we are looking at this, something is happening. I know exactly why it's happening. I immediately give him credit. Yeah, your system is working. I tell him, yeah, it works. Because it does work. So when our questions disappear, our doubts disappear, the mind is feeling subservient to the soul. The mind is feeling these questions don't matter. <clears throat> I'll tell you a true story that happened. Julian Johnson, again, the American disciple of Great Master, accompanied Great Master on a vacation trip to Kashmir. That's a vacation land, nice beautiful mountains there in India. And when they were there, Julian Johnson says, Master, I want to get a beautiful picture of your taken photograph. People take with these little cameras, but they're not good. I want to take a real studio picture of yours. And I'll keep it. And if ever I get a chance to write a book, I'll put that picture in the book. Great Master said, okay, find some place where we can take a picture. So they found a studio called Mahata and Company Photographic Studio. The studio was on the river bank. The river Jhelum was plying in front. The studio was at the bottom and on top was a retail store selling cameras and films. The studio opened to the road and the show, store opened to the river. So Julian Johnson went in his car, took great master, said, Master, wait in the car. I'll make arrangements for your picture to be taken. So he went up in the studio. They said the master, the owner of the shop is upstairs. Go upstairs. So he went upstairs. And one Mr. Mehta was standing there behind the counter. And he said, I want some very nice picture taken of a friend of mine. He said, sure, we are the best photographers here. And he had an assistant who used to work in the studio. His name was Baba. He said, Baba, go with this American guy and get the best picture taken of whoever he's brought with him. So Baba went, they took pictures of great master, pictures which were in many books later on, they still are. And those pictures were taken in their studio, and Baba went up, I've taken the pictures, and delivered them in three days. So after three days, Julian Johnson comes up to pick up the pictures, and he goes to Mr. Mehta, and he says, are the pictures ready? Oh yes, Baba, bring the pictures. Let me see. So he opened the picture and see a picture of an old man, old Indian man with a white beard. He says, you wasted your money on getting these pictures taken. I thought you brought some beautiful uh, uh, Kashmiri girl in her in a typical dress and you took your picture with her or you got her picture. Why did you waste your time? And Julian Johnson says, no. He is not an ordinary person. He is a guru, a satguru, a master. He said, do you know I live in this country and you are a foreigner from another country. This country is full of these fake people calling themselves gurus. How could you, an intelligent person, be trapped by these people? How can you follow a man just because he is a guru? And Julia Johnson said, he didn't say he is a guru. I found out he is a guru. And he can do many things. He said, I don't believe any of this stuff. And if you were telling me this stuff, he has duped you fully. But by the way, what do you do in America? I'm a doctor, I'm a physician and a surgeon. I've been doing this. Oh, you're a doctor? And you still believe in these people? I am disappointed in you. But by the way, what can you do for my back? It's been aching for quite a while. Maybe you know more than my Indian doctors. 
Oh yes, I have a treatment for it. Then can you give me the treatment? You have to come to the Dera. I live with the great master. You have to come there. I can give you the treatment. You have to come there. So, Mr. Mehta says, I must take advantage. It's just a trip to the Dera. So he takes leave of absence from his store and says, Bawa, run the show. I am going to get treatment for my back. My American doctor has come here and he lives right in the Dera. It's only 60, 70 miles. I go there. So he goes to the Dera, received by Julian Johnson and lives with Julian Johnson. And Julian Johnson gives him treatment. He feels better every day. And every morning, Julian Johnson says, I have to go for darshan. I say, what do you mean? I have to go and see the master. He said, are you so stupid still? That you still run after these people? Haven't I told you these are all fake people trying to... Uh, and just by showing the way they can do certain things, they just try to dupe you all. You are a good doctor. Stay with your practice. No, no, you don't know this man. So every day he would go for darshan, he would go for satsang, and this Mr. Mehta would stay in his house, eat his food, feel happy every day. But he couldn't wonder. He couldn't understand. And he wondered, how could this man, highly educated physician and doctor, scientist, from an, an, an America, a Western country, believing in science, how would he come up here and just run after an old man with a white beard? So one day he got tired of this. He said, Dr. Julian Johnson, I won't let you go today till you answer my questions. He said, what are your questions? I have written them down. How do you know he's a guru? What makes a guru? Who is God? How do you know this? He put 12 questions on a piece of paper and gave it to him. He said, you answer these. If you satisfy me, I will also go and look up this man. He said, there is no time. It is time for darshan and satsang. I have to go for satsang now. Master giving a discourse. How, if you walk with me, on the way I can give you the answers. So Mr. Mehta walks with him. And he says, keep, keep on reading the questions. Because you must read all the questions before I can answer them. So he kept on reading question 1, 2, 12 questions. By that time they have reached the satsang. And great master sitting there giving this course. Mr. Mehta sits with Dr. Julian Johnson next to him and waits for the thing to be over so on the way back he can give answers. And as he sits there, great master starts giving answers to his questions. And he looks up surprised. How does he know that I've given these questions to Julian Johnson? He's very surprised at the answers he's getting. At the end, Julia Johnson and they walk back and he says, I am a little surprised this old man knows something because you're answering my questions. How does he know my questions? He says, how many questions did he answer? He said, out of these 12, six he answered today. He said, come one more time. He went next time, all 12 questions were answered. When he was sitting there, the great master, he didn't seem to, the questions seemed to fade away. The questions were disappearing. That, as if it was common sense. As if you should have known like that. So the question disappeared. And then he said, I think this man knows something. I should go and ask for initiation. And he went and got initiated. His family in Kashmir, they got very worried. Where, where is this guy gone? And an elder lady who used to take care of these three brothers, she sent the next elder brother to go and bring him back. She says he was always, the potential of being lured by these people was in this youngest brother, this Mr. Mehta. Go and bring him back. When he came to bring him back, he also got stuck there and got initiated. Ultimately, the whole family got initiated. And to make the story so real, I can tell you, the second brother, who went to bring this guy back, happens to be my father-in-law. I married to his daughter, a powerful daughter from a powerful father. You can always see that. <laughs> anyway, the issue was questions were answered automatically, question disappeared. The secret is 
the answers to all our questions are inside us already. We may not be aware of it. When a person verbalizes it in front of us, you see, that's right. Do you notice that when an answer to a question comes and it appeals to us, see, that's right. That means the question answer is right. Supposing the answer doesn't fit in at all, no, it makes no sense. Which means you are accepting certain answers, not the others. Which ones are you accepting? You're only accepting the answers which are already inside you. And when you meditate and go within, you'll find that all the questions have been answered already in your head. And that is why you're asking the question. It's amazing that you cannot ask a question if the answer is not within you already. It's the question arises from the answer. It's already, but not verbalized, not in your consciousness. And these people who verbalize it outside, they're just making you aware of the answer that is already inside. So that's right, you're right. We accept this. So this is why so many times when we go to these people, these masters, in their casual remarks, they're sometimes giving answers to our questions. And when few questions are answered, we forget about the others. And when there are a series of questions we have on subjects which we think are important, but actually they are trivial, and we get answers to some of the more fundamental questions, we automatically see the triviality of the remaining, and they disappear, and don't even bother about them. It's a great experience to carry questions to a perfect living master and see how they are handled. One more, last. You speak of making the decision of going home. How does one know that it is the right time? You speak of making the decision of going home. No, I don't. <laughs> I say seeking your home, not making decision. When you make decision, you use your mind. When you seek, you so see your soul. Soul. The soul seeks, not the mind. What does the mind seek? Wonderful things outside. Get this better, get this better. Let me have more of this, more of this, all outside. What the soul seek? Soul seeks something that is inside. It doesn't know it's inside. Seeks, seeks love. Seeks true knowledge. Seeks going back home. And try to see where is it. Can't find it outside. Mind says, I'll tell you where it is. Go and find it in that place. Go and find the river. Go and find it in this person. Go and find there. And the soul is left looking for love. Looking for joy and beauty. Looking for bliss. And the mind is saying, I can tell you where to find it, and taking it outside. But then the soul is never satisfied. Once a perfect living master comes and the soul feels that, it's pulled. Mind says, what's going on now? It doesn't want it to happen like that. But the soul is pulled. This is what I was waiting for, for a long, long time. I don't know what it is. But this is what my inmost self is saying, is what I want. Therefore, to go home to a true home is a seeking inside your soul and not a decision that you make. All decision making is just a mental game. But when is the right time? Second part of the question is, when is the right time that this soul comes up with this kind of seeking? Because we have been here for such a long time with the same soul, with the same creation. When is the right time? Right time is when the soul, in combination with the mind, is fed up of what has been happening. This is not my place. I have had enough of it. If you cannot say that to yourself, I have had enough of it. This is not my place. You are not ready and the time is not yet. But when you say that, inwardly, feel like it, you are ready. And the time is right. And that's the time when the perfect living master will come and take you back home. In between, masters can come to fulfill many desires of yours, make you help in making good decisions about life, make good decisions about to be good people, good decision to help others, good decision to be compassionate, good decision about so many other things. Be good teachers, be good examples. A lot of good teachers will come. But when you feel, this is not it. This is not what I have been seeking. I am seeking more than that. I am seeking a truly my place, my home. Perfect living master will come at you. That's the right time. Thank you very much for attending today's program. 
I look forward to seeing you next month, some of those who can come. And we have a small group so that we can keep on moving forward on the spiritual path and not lost in the mire of all these worldly desires and responsibilities and that thing. We have to do them. But keep the priorities correct. They all need to be done. We have to fulfill our obligations, to fulfill our karmic responsibilities. But keep in mind, priority number one, meditation, spiritual path. Priority number two, all the rest. We don't do that. So, oh, I'm very busy today, but tomorrow I do some meditation. The wrong priority. Priority one, no matter what happens, no matter what delay takes place, no matter what will happen to everything else, I have to do the most important thing first. At least five minutes. When I rise in the morning, I'm going to meditate, talk to my master, express my devotion, have some message from him, and spend the whole day smiling with that experience. At night before going to sleep, I spent five minutes with an encounter with the master before going to sleep. Dream, sweet dreams all night long. And we wake up fresh like it's a new beautiful rainbow every morning. That's the kind of life. High priority, morning and night. To meditation, talking to your master, inside, in meditation. See how your life changes. And by the way, if you do these two things, the responsibilities which worry you so much and make them a higher priority get taken care of much better than if you didn't do these two things, the morning and evening. You would wonder how where, much power is taking care of all the responsibilities during the day. It's the same power which draws you five minutes in the morning, five minutes at night. Of course, if you can do more, if you have more time for meditation, the better. But at least five minutes will change your life and you will feel very good about it. Just change the priority. That's number one. Everything else will follow. Thank you very much. Meeting is over. We go home. Those who have asked, or who have been asked by me to stay on for the personal meetings can stay. The rest can go home. Thank you very much.